Okay, that's now one. Let's get started. Um, so first, uh, welcome to uh, our CS sixty one ninety uh, course. It's called probabilistic modeling or probabilistic machine learning. So um, my name is Shen Dianzhu. Uh, this is my email. I'm a assistant professor at School of Computing. So um, my research area focuses on probabilistic machine learning. So you know. You can feel like how I'm happy, how happy I'm able to teach what I'm doing um, every day. Right? So um, briefly introduce myself. I have done probabilistic machine learning for 15 years, I guess. And uh, uh, I work on a lot of research topics um, such as like Bayesian deep learning, probabilistic nonparametrics, uh, physics informed machine learning, physics informed neural networks, probabilistic graphy models, um, uh, large scale machine learning, uh, machine learning simulation, and also I'm passionate in a variety of applications like um, uh, how can we apply machine learning for computational physics? Um, how can we discover differential equations from data? Right? How can we uh, develop a recommendation system? Right? And how can we deal with uh, image brain images or medical images and etc. Um, so today uh, we're gonna talk about first what is machine learning? What is probabilistic machine learning? Right? Uh, oh by the way, how, how many of you have uh, taken my uh, machine learning class before? Oh nice. Okay. Okay. Yeah I'm so happy. <laughs> um, but you will see like throughout this semester uh, what we what we are gonna talk about uh looks like have nothing to do with the cs uh, 5350 or 6350 the machine learning entry level machine learning class so see that although uh probabilistic learning or probabilistic machine learning uh probabilistic modeling can be viewed as a branch of uh, machine learning but the techniques the ideas used in this sub area um, is very much different from uh, uh, those popular algorithm or methods you have uh, heard before or you have learned before, like what we have discussed, like SVM, like uh, gradient boost, uh, the boosting trees, all those kind of stuff. Right? So we're gonna talk about first, what is probabilistic machine learning? Right? So why shall we study probabilistic or Bayesian machine learning? Oh, by the way, probabilistic Bayesian is kind of interchangeable uh, to me. And so uh, whenever we talk about probabilistic learning, and by default, I think you're talking about uh, uh, Bayesian learning. Right? So then we're gonna uh, first go over the cost requirements and policies. Uh, this is a very, very important. We do want to everyone um, to be clear about uh, what we expect you to do uh, in, the, uh, in this course, right? Especially, uh, it, everyone has like two week window, right? To decide whether you're gonna take this uh, course through all this semester or you, you're gonna switch to other course, right? So I want to be very clear about the course requirements and also uh, give you some uh, expectation and a warning message about uh, what kind of challenges you might meet in this course, right? And then we'll start some basic knowledge review and then we'll talk about uh, probabilistic learning, right? Okay, so uh, different from uh, um, my lectures, you know, previous in the past years, right? So I want to know, um, could everybody uh, share why you want to take this class? So what do you want to get after you take this class? You just feel free to share your thoughts. Oh, yeah, 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 sure, <laughs> sure for your case, yeah. Anyway, any other thought? Okay, okay. Any other goals? 
Those are Okay, okay, sounds good. Any other thought? Anyone else want to share? What kind of similar to <laughs> this? Okay. 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 Yeah, that's a that's a that's a that's a great idea. And how many of you are in the PhD program? Okay, most. Okay. Yeah, that's a that, uh, that sounds great. Uh, thanks for letting me know uh, letting me know your uh, your thought. And uh, later I'm gonna discuss about more about like from your expectation, uh, what kind of requirements, uh, what kind of uh, pros and cons, uh, if you decide to take this course. Okay. So first, uh, um, I want to just uh, review what is machine learning, right? So um, since most of you have taken my machine learning class before, so you you can recognize this is actually a quote from my slide from another class, right? From the machine learning class, right? So basically, uh, machine learning uh, algorithm or method. Uh, is that you can create a computer program uh, that can learn from some experience E. Uh, nowadays, what we, we often refer to E uh, as uh, the training data, right? With respect to some class of task T and performance measure P, if its performance at those type of uh, classes in T measured by P improve with experience E, right? So it's kind of like tedious class, but basically tells you that uh, you're not, uh, trying to explicit code some rules uh, into your program and to let it uh, work well. Instead, your program or your algorithm should be able to gain some kind of ability when they see some kind of training data. Here it is called experience, right? And we hope, uh, and uh, we expect that with more and more experience imported into your uh, algorithm or learning algorithm, right? So the performance, of your algorithm doing some particular type of task is, um, is kind of improving. Right? So this is in general uh, what machine learning does. Right? So um, in the modern um, computer science applications, uh, no doubt machine learning has become uh, the driving force, right? especially uh, artificial intelligence applications. Uh, so um, right, we know that uh, AI is kind of like a hot word or buzzword in nowadays. But when I was um, an undergrad student, um, uh, AI is more like a very old word, like uh, the words uh, your grandma uh, is talking about. It's like, we'll learn some AI history. Uh, there, are, there are several waves of uh, AI and then they kind of like uh, uh, depri uh, depression because of some like uh, creative bottlenecks and all kinds of stuff. And luckily, <clears throat> Uh, when I was uh, doing my PhD study, AI becomes hot again. But this time, uh, it's funny that uh, when I started my PhD program, we usually don't call ourselves as AI person. We just uh, just call ourselves a machine learning person. No one is gonna uh, like wrap up themselves by a big word like AI. Like someone was doing like, okay, agents planning, uh, multi-agent learning um, and uh, machine learning, right? Uh, no one will say, okay, I'm, a, I'm an AI person. Right? Plus, because of, uh, uh, I think after 2020, 2000, no, 2012, there's some like big breakthrough uh, made by AI and also subsequent big breakthroughs. Uh, and then some kind of PR uh, demand, which people kind of like pick up this AI word again and then talk about everything, talk about all the exciting uh, applications about AI, but AI, Right now, the driving force is essentially uh, the machine learning and especially uh, the deep learning related machine learning techniques. Right? So just to give some example, like uh, AlphaGo, the AI computer games, right? AlphaGo, um, the Go game is going to be extremely difficult for a computer program to do that, right? 
So, um, however, I forgot, should be 2016 or 2015. I forgot the year, but uh, uh, that was when uh, AlphaGo, the computer program developed by Google, which has uh, uh, defeated the uh, word, the word Go Play in Champion. Um, oh, it's not for it's a former word Go Play, Go, uh, Go Game uh, Champion. Um, he is from South Korean. It's very, it's a legend in that area. He's a legend. And then uh, he, that that go uh, that AlphaGo uh, program beats the current world Go Game Champion, uh, who is from China. And the people start to believe uh, computer programs are really having such kind of capability to be human beings. Right now, like computer programs is a, a way, is a, is a very important tool to train those professional players. Like, so the rules, uh, the game has changed. It's not like you should trust your intuition. <laughs> you should trust people, not trust the machine. But right now, like machines are used to train uh, human players. And image generation. Right? So, uh, how, how many of you heard of like text to image generation? Okay, nice, nice. This is maybe the uh, very hot, the hottest topic in uh, the uh, AI applications. So, basically, uh, people are trying to like, okay, build a program that, okay, if I type a set of uh, sentences, like one or two sentences or several phrases, uh, can you generate a high quality? image which describes that kind of sentence. Right? So uh, this is not funny, but this is not only funny, but also uh, very useful. Like for example, in many, many uh, websites, right? They want to show some interesting stuff, right? They want to uh, build up some materials for advertisement, right? They don't want to like uh, hire some painter, professional painter and design all kinds of stuff, right? If computer Program can help you to generate those images automatically. It's also not boring images. It's very interesting, very funny images. So that's very good. They save a lot of money, but also uh, they can give you imagine power. Right? So, so uh, uh, it's very good, right? So, <clears throat> so this topic is, is very hot. So um, at the beginning, it was uh, trying to be feasible by the so called general adversary networks. Uh, shop name as a GAN. Like people using GAN to do some cell transfer, like if you throw some, uh, if you use like Picasso's uh, words, hard works for training, right? and then you throw some plain images, like the picture taken by a uh, cell phone, they can do some cell transfer. It sounds like, okay, that image was uh, joined by Picasso. That's really, really interesting. Right? And then, uh, like, you know, researchers are trying to improve. There are some kind of shortcomings of training with uh, GAN. So nowadays, like the most of the state of art tactics becomes like sort of uh, diffusion generation model. Right? It's called stable diffusion. And then all large technic giants are developed, are proposing their own uh, packages to generate those kind of images and give a lot of demos. Uh, that's, uh, that's very interesting. And I will suggest you, if you have time, you can take a look at, it's called a stable diffusion, well published or uh, released by some uh, Germany, uh, German university. Uh, uh, it's, it's showing to be the newest state of art. And if you are interested, please, uh, I'll try again. So <clears throat> actually machine learning has, uh, uh, within our daily lives, uh, um, everywhere, right? So uh, no matter you know or you do not, um, you are not aware of right? like uh, spam email detection, like personalized recommendation, like flying control, like uh, automatic autonomous driving, right? Especially the Tesla's uh, autonomous driving. So I know that there are a lot of like argument about the so-called full self, uh, full autonomous uh, self-driving, right? I, I mean, from time to time we, We've heard uh, accidents, or sometimes like the death accidents caused by uh, Tesla's self-autonomous driving. Um, of course, uh, new techniques when they were when they are invented, they always bring some kind of arguments and, and issues. But there's no doubt that it's a, a huge success 
made by machine learning and artificial intelligence technique. I mean, back to 15 years ago, or 20 years ago, people will never ever think about like with machine learning, we can push so far. Like, we can push that so far. Like, <clears throat> especially like for self autonomous uh, self uh, driving, I think in Tesla is the, perhaps the most bold company. Like they use kind of like technical uh, plan, like they uh, give out the radars, like they give out, totally give out radars. I only use uh, eight cameras on this uh, car and collect the images and then reconstruct the 3D scenarios and label, you know, barricades, stop signs, traffic lights, um, pedestrian, all kinds of stuff. I'm doing that. Um, well, of course, there are still problems, but they're still kind of adv advancing their techniques. This is really, really impressive. And also, this is just a list of uh, machine learning applications. You might have seen them before when I um, brag about machine learning applications. Uh, you might see uh, some 53, 50 or 63, um, 50 class. Right? <clears throat> but <clears throat> so far, right? um, after we have seen so many exciting applications, or after we have uh, realized machine learning has uh, uh, been made such large impact in our daily lives, what is uh, machine learning? What is probabilistic machine learning? Right? So after all, we need to <laughs> touch the ground. Right? We need to look at the math. We, we, we look at look at the details about what the, uh, the, the probabilistic learning, right? That's the, the goal of our class, right? <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so here we give a, a kind of like, uh, a kind of formal, but uh, very general definition. So probabilistic learning uh, is a branch of machine learning that uses probabilistic principles or Bayesian principles for model design and algorithm development. So you see that throughout this class, when we talk about a model, when we talk about the computation, namely the algorithm itself, they're all driven by probabilistic principles. So what is probabilistic principles? So basically, we view everything as random. We view this guy, we view weather, we view outcomes, we view input variables, we view all kinds of stuff we're interested in as random variables. We want to use probability tools like prior likelihood, postures, those stuff to design the model and to compute. So, <clears throat> You can imagine like a human being, right? How we um, humans are learning things from scratch, right? So at the beginning, we have some uh, prior knowledge right? to whatever things we have. For example, uh, before you watch some kind of movie like Avenger 2, right? You might have some like a very rough impression from expectation, whatever, right? We call it prior beliefs or prior knowledge. In the probabilistic learning world, um, we call this as prior distribution. Like beta are something we're interested in, here we will it as some kind of random variables. And then <clears throat> how can we learn things uh, from human beings? We use our eyes, we use our ears, we use our hands to practice all kinds of stuff. And from the Program like from the algorithm itself, we can see that it it is receiving data, right? It is receiving all kinds of data. Like, and how do we absorb information and knowledge from data? Right? We have a uh, some kind of like biological mechanism to absorb that, which we even do not know right now. Right? But from uh, a probabilistic learning uh, perspective, we're going to construct a model the data with so-called data likelihood. Okay. So data likelihood encode or simulate knowledge from data. And then we're gonna combine our prior knowledge, prior beliefs, prior experience with the knowledge we extracted from data to update our knowledge, right? So <clears throat> the update knowledge 
updated leaves or updated experience or upgraded experience by in the probabilistic framework is called the posterior distribution. Okay. So how can we integrate our prior knowledge and also the new information extracted from data? Okay. From a mathematical framework, we use the so-called base rule. So everyone has heard base rule before, right? So it's a very fundamental rule, but it's a very powerful rule. So basically, if you want to compute our updated beliefs or knowledge, which are represented by posterior distribution, we're going to multiply our prior distribution with the data likelihood and normalize it. Okay. And normalization is done by integration. But later, we'll see that uh, actually <laughs> this integration is the key computational challenge in probabilistic learning. <clears throat> Oh, by the way, any questions so far? You can interrupt me at any time. Okay. So um, I will happy to answer uh, any questions or discuss with you, given that our class is not large. <clears throat> so what, what is the advantage of um, probabilistic learning? From the uh, modern perspective, it provides kind of unified and principled mathematical framework to learn almost everything. Or for every task. So if you have taken my um, entry-level machine learning class before, like CS uh, 53, uh, 50, 63, uh, 50, you see that you must have seen that okay for different models we come up we're coming out with some like different loss functions, right? Some loss functions is kind of like updating to the data. Some kind of you have to add some regularization, right? And to kind of summarize our loss group, then we give some kind of framework like uh, empirical race. Uh, like risk um, minimization and uh, regularized risk minimization and so on, right? And also, uh, you have to explain why you're going to use square loss for the, your linear regression problem, why you use hinge loss for your SVM, why you use logistic regression for your binary classification problem, right? And so basically, for every problem, you have to come out kind of loss, you have to uh, explain the rationality, right? You have to practice all kinds of stuff. But in in the probabilistic machine learning world, you don't have a, you don't have to worry about that, right? You kind of like model everything as a, a probabilistic model. Right? You need to consider how I'm gonna assign the prior to the parameters I'm interested in because the parameters here are viewed as random variables. And then you're gonna consider okay, what kind of likelihood uh, I'm going to use to describe the data. Of course, you have a zoo of likelihood. You have a, you have a library of likelihood, and uh, you're free to choose whatever you feel are comfortable. And then once you construct the model, right, the model is there, then the computation follows the same framework. Your goal is to compute the posterior distribution. Right? And then, of course, uh, the posterior distribution is really very difficult to compute. I need to work out with uh, uh, a lot of like different types of approximation methods, but all of those kind of steps are unified in the same framework. And you don't need to worry about, or you don't need to invent any heuristics or think about any, uh, uh, or invent any uh, new stuff. And the second advantage is that uh, progressive learning is born to give you the capability to reason under uncertainty. So uncertainty, uh, quantification, uncertain reason is actually a very, very important practice. Um, for example, like if you want to do some healthcare stuff, right? Uh, you don't want to hear like your doctor uh, told you that, okay, uh, you will die tomorrow, right? Or uh, you will be, um, you can live um, to 100, right? So age of 100, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's really not possible, right? In most of the cases, you, you, you would like to hear about, okay, how much chance you, you will survive like from this disease or how much chance you get ill, like heart disease, all kinds of stuff, right? You need some kind of like um, confidence, right? like in the uh, weather forecast, right? Um, what we hear, okay, you got like 70% chance of rain, 30% uh, chance of summit, so then you decide whether you stay home or go outside. So um, 
in addition to that, I want to give some example like uh, more related to revenue. Like, for example, in, uh, in your recommendation system, like in Amazon or in Facebook, all those kind of stuff, you know, those companies are trying to uh, show or recommend advertisement or uh, some kind of commodities to you. If you click them and they're gonna receive some kind of revenue. Uh, if you click into that and buy some, they, they're gonna receive a little bit more revenue. Uh, however, <clears throat> so, so their revenue, like, per percent revenue is very, very uh, small, like maybe 0 0.03 cents, something like that. But because they have a huge amount of users, like they might have a, uh, uh, 33 billion users, right? Or, uh, 200 million users, those kind of level, right? Even you have a very, very low chance to click the advertisement to show you or even buy them. But if you multiply the huge population for their users, uh, they're gonna still earn a lot of money every minute. Okay. So here, so there are key, uh, um, the key step or the key, the key step in, in their um, profit generation is that how to attract you to click the things they recommend to you, either videos, maybe TikTok is also living on that, right? videos or advertisements or products or whatever. Right? So how do they do that? Right? You want to recommend some something to you. <clears throat> Every such kind of company, they're trying to build some personalized model for you. Um, Every time you log into the website, uh, they're gonna accumulate the data to track the history of what you have done. Right? And based on that, they build out some like machine learning model to predict what kind of things you might be interested in. Um, and usually, um, their recommendation strategy is like, okay, uh, given that you have uh, watched a bunch of video about football, and then they're gonna recommend another football video to you. However, if you keep doing this, like you, you might feel boring. Like, you might feel okay, it's so stupid. Like, I want to see something fresh, something might stimulate my new interest. Like, so does those company uh, consider about that? Yes, they consider. Like, so <clears throat> they want to recommend or push some 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 kind of uh, new things to you from time to time, and trying to attract their new interest, and also trying to form find or why you from like you feeling boring. Like how can we do that? How can we do that? This is a so-called exploitation, exploration and exploitation strategy. It's very, very well known in the online advertising recommendation um, domain. Right? So um, basically like those kind of like program or machine learning model well, based upon your current status and also your profiles, and they're gonna they're gonna compute how likely you like you're gonna click the items they're gonna recommend to you. Okay? And if those chance or those probabilities be evaluated, it's not very high, like 60% chance, then they're gonna uh, that will trigger some kind of mechanism. Like they're gonna randomly pick up a new item to you, and, and hopefully the new item kind of like, stimulate your interest. But how do you decide like when I should trigger this uh, new fresh things? You have to do some kind of uncertain quantification. You have to quantify how likely you like it. Uh, what's your confidence uh, you will like this football game? Uh, really. <clears throat> so currently in the uh, industry, like we tend to use very simple heuristics to uh, come out some of the uncertain score. But some companies like some research labs, uh, they have developed some like more principled ideas like using probability framework to calculate the posterior variance of your chance that you like that. If the variance is too large, then you will consider uh, I recommend random recommending you something new. This is a uh, another example to show why our reasoning uh, is important. Like, <clears throat> and 
some other example, like this is a well, well uh, known death accident um, in Tesla's uh, autonomous driving a few years ago. And when the car, the, the driver actually was watching Harry Potter um, and didn't look at the roads. So he let the car to drive um, themselves, right? But unfortunately, the car did not or failed to differentiate the sky, the white uh, cloud here, and also the truck because they're both white. So finally, the car hit the body of this truck and crashed. Right? So <clears throat> this is kind of a multi example, motivating uh, some example uh, to show why uncertainty quantification is important. Right? So imagine that if your car your self-autonomous driving um, software has some uh, ability to quantify their uncertainty. Even if you cannot differentiate the clouds and uh, the white truck, you can at least uh, warn the driver that, okay, my uncertainty is high. I'm a very, I have a big standard deviation of my classifier's uh, prediction. So please, please, uh, please get into the control. Right. Otherwise, like sometimes even you give some kind of binary decision, you do not realize that how unconfident you know, you're about that classification that will cause a very severe accidents. Any questions so far? Everyone's comfortable? You're just uh, jumping because right now we're just talking about very uh, general <laughs> ideas and examples and trying to uh, give you some concrete feeling about uh, the principal uh, advantages and challenges uh, about this uh, type of machine learning techniques, right? So <clears throat> we have a, I'm just a bragging about uh, uh, advantages of uh, probabilistic learning, right? That's the uh, motivation that uh, make me sit down and uh, sticking onto this uh, direction, but there are also critical challenges in this area, right? <clears throat> so first the challenge, right? So <clears throat> because probabilistic uh, learning, like insist on modeling everything in the probabilistic world. Right? The probabilistic world is a very principled, uh, very rigorous uh, framework. However, <clears throat> in practice, like many lot knowledge and assumptions or kinds of stuff uh, is not uh, intuitive to, or easy to directly convert it into probabilistic world. Like for example, how do you convert heuristic rules into a, a probabilistic uh, Distribution. So we do that in practice, uh, like experienced people for their own domain, they kind of summarize a bunch of like rules and sums. Right? And it's not very easy to, okay, to write down a distribution that can describe your rules of sums. That's from the modern perspective. Right? Another, from my perspective, more important challenge is from uh, the calculation. As we mentioned, right, <clears throat> the goal of the uh, probabilistic uh, uh, modeling, uh, probabilistic learning, is to calculate the posterior distribution of whatever we're interested in, given the data. Right? So, <clears throat> and from the uh, standard rule of the base rule, we know that we need to multiply the prior with the likelihood, then normalized uh, by the marginal distribution. So this normalization actually. Uh, is integral of this uh, product, right? So the key bottleneck comes from uh, this normalizer. Why? Because uh, <clears throat> because the theta, theta here represents whatever things we're interested in. It can be an image, it can be some audio, it can be a piece of text, uh, it can be whatever uh, you're interested in, right? So this integral, however, uh, is really very hard. Right? Why? Because Theta itself is often very, very high dimensional. And also <clears throat> P theta and P D given theta, prior likelihood often is very complicated. So <clears throat> usually this integration does not have any analytical form. That means uh, if you want to get some reasonable uh, result about posterior distribution, you have to seek for some uh, approximation techniques. So actually, how do we do approximate computation is one central topic in probability learning. Right? So here we <clears throat> just to summarize the three types of um, methods of doing 
posterior distribution uh, estimation, right? So <clears throat> the first one is called the Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling, right? You might have heard of this before. Uh, it was uh, invented even before the machine learning was invented. So uh, it basically uses uh, a Markov chain to simulate the posterior distribution. So they kind of like smartly design a chain where the transition kernel of that chain encode the prior and likelihood information. So they can guarantee that as importantly, the samples generated by this Markov chain will follow the target posterior distribution. Okay? It's called MCMC sampling. Right? We're gonna talk about uh, the general idea, which is from the Trump existing idea. Then we'll talk about Gibbs sampling. We'll talk about uh, Hamiltonian uh, dynamic sampling. Hamiltonian uh, uh, Monte Carlo sam uh, Hamiltonian sampling, right? Or hybrid Monte Carlo sampling. Right? This one uh, perhaps is the gold, gold standard in terms of the accuracy because it has uh, some target guarantee. However, in practice, MCMC sampling is really uh, too slow. Right? So um, that's why we also seek for other types of uh, optimization, uh, other types of uh, approximations. One is called the variational approximations. The other is uh, called belief propagation. So variational approximation uh, is also uh, very, uh, one very important topic for kind of focus in our uh, class. So basically, they kind of like convert the integration problem. You see that the central challenge in base rule is compute this integration to get a normalizer, right? Um, the variational technique is kind of convert this integration problem into an optimization problem. They will, they will see, you will see later a kind of equivalent representation of a base rule. You see that base rule can also be represented or formulated as an optimization problem. Of course, if you just solve that optimization problem, you won't be able to solve it. Um, but if you can relax some constraint, like you can like you reduce the range of the posterior distribution, then the optimization problem becomes much, much easier. So that's the idea of the version of approximation. So want to, they, they, they want to restrict the, the approximations family of this posterior so that make the optimization a lot easier. A third idea is called the belief propagation. So um, it depends on, it actually builds, uh, it's built, it's built on a graphical representation of your probabilistic model. So that is also called probabilistic graphing models. So <clears throat> they will will like, okay, your probabilistic model, so theta here can be a lot of random variables, right? And according to how you design your joint probability distribution over theta, you can draw some kind of graphic representations. Different graphic representations uh, uh, represent different uh, independency or conditional independences among those random variables. So we can leverage those uh, structure to accelerate the computation of the posterior distribution. For example, if your graphic representation of your distribution is uh, a tree or a chain, then uh, it is very easy to compute the uh, computer posterior distribution. However, if your, if your graph contains some loops, and it's really, there's no way to exactly compute the posterior distribution, but we can still try to send a clear message and propagate those messages through all these graphs uh, again, again, on two convergence. Um, and finally, you'll get the posterior distribution of the variable on the graph nodes, right? So this type of method is called belief propagation. And from the optimization point of view, they're essentially doing some uh, fixed iterations to it. Uh, uh, to, to minimize some kind of energy function design on the graph. But, but anyway, we're gonna get into that later uh, in your class. Okay, so far, any question regarding the general introduction about probabilistic learning idea? Everyone feels comfortable? Not scared? All right, okay, great. So <clears throat> what's the goal of this course, right? So uh, we're gonna cover both classical and the state of our approaches to deal with the, the challenges in uh, probability learning. Right? 
So <clears throat> next, we're gonna overview this course through looking at uh, our syllabus, right? <clears throat> So uh, that's why I'm gonna switch to the syllabus here. Oops. Okay, so can everyone see clearly? Let me enlarge the font. Is it clear to everyone? Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, all the information <clears throat> is uh, released in our uh, course website. It's very simple to uh, locate our course website. Uh, you can just go into my um, uh, personal homepage, uh, which you can search my name. Uh, don't search my Chinese name. Uh, it won't show up because uh, just the figure, it won't convert it to real Chinese characters. Right? Just search my uh, English name. Right. And in the Google, uh, the first one you click into that is my uh, personal website. <clears throat> and then you can you see uh, uh, there's a teaching section and there's a link to our course website and everything is contained here. Right. <clears throat> of course, we have also the syllabus uh, contains the, uh, uh, everything, but we want to kind of like duplicate those information to make it more accessible to everyone. Right. So, <clears throat> You see that there's uh, some basic information and cost policies uh, on list uh, in every tab here. And there are also topics here, right? Uh, but don't worry, I'm gonna explain those topics uh, later in syllabus. And also I, I guess uh, there will be one tab uh, which is most important to everyone. It's called lecture tab. <clears throat> so we'll record uh, the lecture video <clears throat> uh, in real time and then stream it to some YouTube channel. So if you uh, don't have time to come to the class or you intend to, uh, you, you, want to you want to review the lectures uh, later, right? And just feel free to uh, click the link. But here I haven't, uh, I haven't posted the link here, but after today's lecture, I will post the YouTube link of this uh, uh, lecture here. So whenever you want to review the past lectures, you can get into this lecture tab and click uh, whatever video you want to look at, right? And uh, uh, if you don't want to access those videos from my uh, from our course webpage, you can, it's, a, it's, it's very easy to find in, in YouTube, right? You just search uh, Utah Data Science Group. Just search like Utah Data Science. There will be some uh, channel. If you click into the channel, you see uh, those lecture videos uh, have been uploaded into the channel. Of course, it's not only including my lecture videos and also including a lot of other uh, lecture videos. So feel free to uh, find them. Right? And we're gonna uh, release our lecture slides uh, before the class. Right? So if you are interested, uh, you want to look at the slides before you take the class or you want to look at the slides while you're taking the class uh, in your own laptop, right? <clears throat> you can just click them and say, this is a lecture slice today, right? And, uh, and download, right? <clears throat> and also uh, another uh, tab I think is more, uh, most important too is, a, is the project tab, where, which, which, which we're gonna uh, uh, review, revisit later, right? They talk about uh, the specific requirements of the course projects. Okay, <clears throat> so let us uh, first uh, uh, look at this basic information page, right? So um, this is my office, uh, MEB of uh, three level, 3466, right? So this is my email and we've got two TAs. Um, uh, here is their Dalong and uh, uh, Xin Yu is their uh, email address, right? <clears throat> and we got office hours. We got uh, office hour in every weekday. It's the same as uh, uh, our uh, entry level machine learning class, right? And here is the time. And the location, we're trying to schedule uh, the physical locations uh, for the T office hour, but it might be, uh, it might only take effect since uh, next week. So we're gonna update uh, once it's, uh, uh, it's uh, decided or scheduled. Right? And my office hour is, is just in my office. Right? Feel free to stop by on Wednesday from 2, uh, uh, 12.30 to 1.30. Right? So now <clears throat> uh, I'm gonna click into 
the syllabus. Right? So you can also access the syllabus uh, in the cameras. Right? If you look at the homepage, uh, there's a link to the course website, course website and also the, 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 uh, the PDF of the syllabus, right? So, um, okay. <clears throat> So the description of this course is as follows. I'm just read it and to give you a, a systematic view, right? The course introduces um, basic knowledge about probabilistic modeling and learning. Topics cover fundamental concepts of Bayesian statistics, probabilistic graphing models, generalized linear models, approximate inference, including variational inference, message passing, uh, that is belief propagation, right? and uh, markup chain Monte Carlo. And we're gonna also talk about the cutting edge uh, research topic in probabilistic learning, including Bayesian neural networks, Bayesian deep neural networks, Gaussian process, uh, Gaussian process regression, and general those networks, which is now listed here. Right. And after taking a class, we expect that you will be able to you understand the principles and paradigms of probabilistic learning. Right. That's the um, that's our basic expectation. Right. Uh, you will be able to explore relevant literature, right? Leverage existing or even create new probabilistic modeling or learning tools for your own research interest, right? And also, uh, you will be well prepared to dive into the cutting edge research in probabilistic machine learning, right? So we know, uh, we, we know that, you know, in this area, um, the progress is fast, right? People are like every year in your NIPS, there are like thousands of papers are published. Like, and every every time like your NIPS uh, is kind of accepting like 10,000 papers every year. So it's, a, it's a really, really uh, progressing fast. So we're not able to cover all the cutting edge technique. What we can do is trying to cover all the necessary knowledge for you to uh, investigate the cutting edge research. Right? <laughs> So here's some warning, right? Um, this course is quite math intensive, right? And also requires a certain level of, uh, of the programming capabilities with Python, MATLAB, R, right? Um, Python components might require TensorFlow, PyTorch, or JAX, right? I didn't list the JAX here, but you're free to use that if you want to use, if you want, right? <clears throat> Uh, overall, the coding workload is not heavy. It's not as heavy as uh, 5350 or 6350. However, uh, it requires mathematical derivations right? because you're implementing probabilistic models with Python. Right? You need to know all the mathematical details. Also, you need to debug if uh, your vector, your tensor, matrix operations uh, have something wrong. Right? So it might, it might be difficult for someone. Right? So you need to be familiar with linear algebra and also you have to be very careful for debugging. So this is a major uh, uh, challenge. So it's both uh, mass intensive and also uh, demanding in programming. So uh, that's, that's why I sincerely ask you to uh, consider this, taking this class uh, seriously. Right? And also, uh, once you if, you, if you really decide to take that class, but after it goes a while, going for a while, and you feel like uncomfortable or something wrong, or feel stressed, please do not uh, hide, right? Do not hesitate, just uh, come to me for the help, right? And otherwise you might be, you might freak out or you might got pissed, got, got pissed off and uh, feel angry to me. And that's not what I, one, right? That's not what we want, right? For example, some students, you know, last year, um, they kind of like feel very, very stressed up until the late end of the semester. And they kind of like uh, sh uh, yell at me for 40 minutes during the office hour and asking why you don't tell me, why don't you tell me uh, you feel difficult, feel challenged about this course beginning, at the beginning, right? If you feel difficult, I'll, I'll help you, right? But at the end of the semester, how, how should I, how can I do for you? So don't hesitate. If you feel uncomfortable, if you feel anything kind of challenging or you're not able to continue or with any problems or difficulties, um, you know, just let me know, right? So, um, 
So what kind of books um, uh, do we need, right? So the major reference book for this course is called Pattern Recognition and Machine Learning. It's a very, very classical machine learning book um, released in 2007. Uh, it's actually um, the book um, I used when I, when I was a PhD student. Right? Um, it's kind of like, a, it sounds like a little bit uh, old or outdated, but it's not outdated at all. The book covers all the necessary knowledge we need. As, as very in depth, sorry, the, the book is very well written, it's very clear, right? and also it's very thick. Right? And, and I think one best uh, uh, advantage of this book is free. It's completely free. You don't need to uh, spend any dollars to buy it. You can just uh, download them um, online. Right? <clears throat> Although uh, our lecture slides will cover the content, right? It's self-contained. Right? Uh, we still encourage you to read through the corresponding chapters. Again, we're not able, we're, we're not be able to cover the whole book. It's a very thick book. We're gonna cover a few like very important uh, chapters. And we'll suggest you that, okay, uh, after we introduce those uh, topics, uh, um, just read through more examples and more discussion in the book. Like, <clears throat> it will give you um, it will definitely help you. It will definitely help, right? And in addition to this book, uh, we, we we might cover a few uh, topics not covered by the by the book, right? And uh, for those book uh, for those topics, we'll provide some extra reading materials, maybe some uh, lecture notes or maybe some uh, um, uh, other papers. Um, and in addition. Uh, we uh, we also give uh, the list of uh, other references. Right? If you're interested and if you have time, uh, you can take a look. The first one is uh, written by Kevin Murphy. He's now in Google. He wrote a even thicker book it's called Machine Learning: A Probabilistic Perspective. Um, I think it's uh, one thousand two hundred pages, something like that. Uh, it's too thick, and I'm I do not suggest you to read through it very very carefully. It's too thick. And uh, uh, you might just use it as kind of like dictionary. Okay. You're interested in that. And I'm not very satisfied with that book, honestly. <laughs> um, and this, and also uh, this book is called Information Theory, Inference and Learning Algorithm. And it's, it's kind of early, early time. In other words, uh, written early time, uh, but it was written by a very important pioneer in the artificial intelligence, uh, David McKay, who has passed away. Um, uh, introduced a very, very, very strong and uh, intuitive connection between probabilistic inference, information theory, and learning algorithm. And Larry Wasserman, uh, all of statistics. If you want to have a quick review or access of a basic statistic concepts, uh, this book is really, really good. Right? Um, <clears throat> and uh, Sydney Rasnick, a probabilistic pass. If you want to know more in depth about probability matter theory, so we won't cover like uh, too much about my theory. We'll talk about like basic concepts for you to better understand some some ideas. We won't talk about what is uh, what is the formal de definition of uh, a probability measure, uh, inverse image, like random variable. I mean, random variable is not like what do you think? Is uh, if you if you look at my theory, a random variable is actually a mapping between um, between a probabilistic space, which is Constructed by some sigma algebra to some to some uh, so some, to some other uh, uh, metric space, but but anyway, if you want to uh, dive into a more rigorous framework, um, you want to know what is what is really rigorous definition of uh, probability, um, please take a look at this book. It's very good. It's very friendly to computer science background, like me. I'm not from the mathematical department. So I have to self-learn those kind of stuff uh, from some uh, from from some books. This book is something I recommend. Okay. And uh, the last reference book I recommend is uh, uh, written by uh, Daphne uh, Kola, a uh, very famous professor from Stanford. She wrote this probabilistic graphing models, principles, and tactics. Another very very thick book. Again, please use it as a, um, a dictionary rather than read through it. Okay, any question regarding uh, the reference and books? Any concerns? 
Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. <clears throat> and these are the uh, prerequisites of this class. Uh, I guess uh, all of you um, have satisfied these prerequisites. We list it here for reference. And here we just want to uh, tell why uh, those uh, prerequisites are listed here. We want to ensure everyone has enough background about calculus, statistics, and linear algebra. And also you have a uh, <clears throat> capability of uh, algorithm design and programming skills. Getting help. So I think uh, this might be the most useful hint for, um, for students, right? So um, I will highly recommend um, everyone to take advantage of the instructor and TA office hours. Right? So uh, I mean, throughout my teaching, I always try to schedule um, office hours for every weekday so that it is accessible to all the students. Uh, unfortunately, uh, through quite a few years of observation, I found that in 95% of the time, office hours are empty. And that's why I have to repeat this again and again. So um, if you feel difficulty or if you have some any problems, uh, uh, even you just want to chat, right? please leverage uh, the office hours. Right? Don't let TA and me just sitting there and boring. Right? Um, try to leverage those uh, uh, office hours and uh, uh, get help. Right? <clears throat> We'll, we'll work hard to access, right? To be accessible uh, to all of you, right? Um, if you want to uh, meet outside the office hours, like please send us emails and don't be shy. Right? If you don't, if you uh, if you feel like you feel to understand something or something you need to clar you need to clarify, right? Come to the office hours or speak up in the class. Right? That's the uh, most effective way of learning. Right? I've seen uh, too many cases like okay. Students are just watching the lecture videos and all the lecture slides, right? They don't ask, they don't interact, but they spend a lot of time on that. Right? That's why, I mean, although I record the videos, I stream them to the YouTube channel. I really hope everyone can join the lecture and interact with me. That's the most effective way to learn all those stuff. Right? And uh, you, you, like, you spend efficiently uh, this uh, one, I think one and a half hours, right? twice a week, it is more efficient than you like spend five hours or six hours to watch those slides without taking, le uh, taking the lecture. So please try to <clears throat> uh, join the class in person, try to uh, get involved in the class and uh, get help from the TA in office hours. Uh, we're trying our best to, to, uh, to provide any help. Um, We we'll also use uh, Canvas discussion group, and I found many discussions uh, uh, in my previous uh, teaching. Uh, that's good. Right? <clears throat> so you feel free to post the questions regarding uh, homework assignments or project reports related to the class, right? So or asking schedules, uh, materials, all, all kinds of stuff, right? <clears throat> and feel free to answer uh, answer questions. Uh, it's uh, not like TAs or instructors. Um, their job to answer questions. If you feel like you can't help, like just uh, uh, speak up and uh, uh, post answers. That's a that would be very useful as well. But again, uh, don't post potential homework answers. Right. So someone uh, may ask, okay, I don't know how to solve that problem. I don't know how to prove that thing. You might just say, okay, you can think about uh, using Jensen's inequality or uh, using some kind of uh, lemma, but never list uh, the steps to finish that problem, right? If you find that, we have to delete them. That's not uh, a lot, right? And also, um, we're gonna make uh, announcements uh, through the discussion group. Uh, from time to time, you might see, okay, there's some kind of reschedule of the office hours. Our TAs might have their own um, uh, things to deal with, right? Or uh, uh, some other things, but uh, uh, but usually uh, there won't be uh, too many uh, announcements in the uh, in the cameras. Right? But if it if it is, just uh, keep an eye on that. Right? Okay. Any question regarding this? Right? Um, how to uh, interact in this class and how to get help? Yeah. By the way, uh, you're encouraged to 
discussed offline. Like if you want to solve some kind of problem, uh, you and your fellows want to like stay uh, in a conference room or in a classroom, you try to derive something in a blackboard, that's uh, more than welcome. Right? But just uh, do not post questions or detailed answers in cameras. The reason is that um, once you discuss someone offline, you're trying to interact with each other, right? You're trying to discuss, you kind of like stimulate uh, each other. That's uh, uh, that's uh, uh, that's very, very encouraging. However, if you just uh, um, discuss online, uh, that would be, that, that is much, much less efficient. I don't want like someone to just uh, like get, get faded, right? From others, right? I want you to uh, think and discuss, right? Think and interact, right? Okay, and here are the uh, list of the uh, uh, tentative uh, topics, right? So, um, so basically, we're gonna introduce uh, the probability learning techniques, uh, is like a building, building a house. Right? We're gonna spend a few, I guess, uh, maybe two weeks or three weeks. We're gonna talk about the, the basics, which is very important for us to build probability models and also uh, introduce the algorithms. So what kind of basic concepts and the statistic, uh, um, statistics we want to introduce, right? We're gonna uh, introduce what is probability space, what's the definition, definition of random variables, what is uh, cumulative density functions, um, probability density functions, expectation variance, independence, et cetera. I believe uh, um, most of those concepts you have seen before, right? But here we just want to quickly review them, but then we want to introduce what is the probability uh, prob probability space, right? Uh, which is not, which might be, uh, which which uh, uh, you might uh, hear less, much less before, right? Then we're gonna review a bunch of commonly used probability distributions. You see that those distributions uh, will be frequently used for design of practical machine learning models, right? For example, the multivariate Gaussian distributions multivariate student T distributions, right? Beta distribution, gamma distribution, inverse gamma distributions. I will see that gamma distribution or inverse gamma distributions are usually all of, are very often used to model the variance of the data. Dirichlet distributions, if you want to do multi-class classification problems, Dirichlet distribution is kind of standard, right? Uh, the multivariate Gaussian distributions uh, is uh, related to uh, many applications like linear regression or generalized linear models or the uh, Gaussian processes models. They all rely uh, that you are familiar with uh, the properties of uh, multivariate Gaussian distributions. Okay. And then we're, we're gonna talk about uh, uh, several commonly used statistical estimation framework like maximum likelihood estimation, maximum a posterior estimation. Uh, then we're, we're, we'll proceed to a more basic flavor ideas, like what is predictive distribution? Right? So it's different from maximum likelihood estimation, it's different from map, map a posterior estimation because both MLE and MEP are doing point estimation. This is actually not a Bayesian people, a Bayesian guy wants, right? A Bayesian guy wants a predictive distribution, right? You see that predictive distribution essentially kind of integrate out all the possible predictions. You give you a distribution of the prediction given only the training data, right? You want to integrate out, out as many intermediate variables as possible, okay? That's called predictive distribution. Then we'll, call, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about type two maximum likelihood estimation, right? So type two maximum likelihood estimation is the standard way to train the so-called Gaussian process models, right? So uh, you see that what is type two maximum likelihood estimation and why type two maximum likelihood estimation can avoid overfitting. It's not cross-validation. Uh, you just maximize some kind of single object, but it internally do some kind of trade-off between model complexity and data fitting. Right? <clears throat> and then we'll talk about the empirical-based framework. Right? So empirical-based framework uh, um, coming out from, uh, is coming out from the full Bayesian framework, but they want to kind of reduce some computation because computation is always a bottleneck in machine learning. You have to trade off some, uh, 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 some, uh, uh, idealism, right? And then we'll talk about some uh, Bayesian decision theory, uh, Bayesian model selection. 
from Bayesian perspective, how do you make decision? What is the optimal decision, right? And uh, how do you select models from Bayesian perspective? Of course, this selection procedure, again, is uh, modeled as uh, a probabilistic uh, distribution, right? <clears throat> then we will introduce non-informative priors. Okay. Um, Non-informative non priors means that I want to um, induce or introduce less prior files or prior preference as less as possible, right? <clears throat> and there's, there are a lot of ways to construct non-informative priors. Sometimes uh, people call this objective basing, right? Why it's called objective basing? Because as we just mentioned, right? In the basing framework, you have some prior knowledge, right? You have some prior preference about whatever, like whether uh, like a weather condition tomorrow, right? You have some of your own preference. Then you integrate with the data, you want to get positive distribution of the weather condition, right? However, um, this kind of framework uh, is criticized by a bunch of other people that are saying, okay, uh, if you want to really be neutral, uh, want to be standard, you shouldn't have any bias, right? So now how do you conduct such kind of things? Uh, and only let the data speak. So how can how can how can you model how can uh, how 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 can you fulfill this kind of like goal in the uh, Bayesian framework? This is called objective Bayesian. Right? You want to create a prior distribution without containing any information, any bias information, right? or at least uh, as less information as possible. Right? And then you integrate data and then let the data to dominate the whole posterior distribution. Right? So that's why people call people create the so-called non-informative priors. Right? Then we'll talk, we'll talk about definitive uh, theory and the Bayesian philosophy. So you see the definitive theory actually is the fundamental, uh, it's kind of like foundation or cornerstone of uh, many Bayesian modeling techniques is tells you the exchangeability, right? And given the exchangeability assumption, uh, you can make your, you can simply, you can still simplify model, but not as much as using ID assumption. Right? ID assumption means uh, identically independent distributed, right? In many real world, Applications, ID assumptions are too simplified. Right? You cannot assume your examples are kind of like independent, identity distributed. Right? What if your examples are dependent and highly correlated? Right? What kind of model would you like? Right? You can use the so-called uh, conditional dependency, right? uh, <clears throat> which is reflecting definite theory. Right? There we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about exponential family and the conjugate price. This is a uh, this is a, a very important um, um, why we introduce exponential family because it's a set of a uh, large family of distributions which can be used to address all kinds of like practical problems, but they are simple enough, meaning that they have a very nice structure such that their computation is uh, very, very convenient. And we'll talk about conjugate priors. Um, for if you um, have conjugate priors, that means you don't need to worry about the posterior distribution. The posterior distribution is analytically. Uh, uh, tractable has a closed form. Um, so we need to know what kind of uh, commonly used conjugate priors. Right? <clears throat> yeah, once we have a uh, uh, familiar, get familiar, familiarized with those basic concepts and the uh, Bayesian statistical tools, that means we have a master all kind of like basic units. With them, we can build up our models, right? <clears throat> we'll start with the so-called generalized linear models, right? So, <clears throat> We we'll start with basing linear regression, logistic regression, and probability regression. You see that even for linear models, if from Bayesian perspective, uh, that will give you many, many more exciting views. Okay? You see that how the posterior distribution of your prediction kind of uh, vary along the position you want to predict, at, at which you want to predict, or how the posterior distribution of your prediction will kind of like get contracted, will add more and more data points. That's the idea of. Uh, Bayesian stuff, right? When you receive more and more data, your prediction uncertainty should uh, be less and less. You should be more and more confident, right? I will talk about multi-class logistic regression, all in the regression, like using probability framework, how do you handle different type of classification and uh, regression problems? Right? <clears throat> and finally, we're gonna generalize uh, our linear models uh, in exponential family. So <clears throat> don't get confused about the linear model structure. It has some kind of linear models, but they can model nonlinear things. Right? So uh, it's like if I append some kind of nonlinear feature transformation, then put them into a linear structure, then all kinds of uh, uh, 
uh, basing linear model inference techniques uh, is still applicable, but you can model very complicated, very complicated things. Right? From some perspective, like basing neural network, like basing multi-layer perception, is a type of generalized linear models. Then we're going to move to um, the topic is called probabilistic graphing models. As we just mentioned, um, if you have a large probabilistic system, which consists of like a large number of the variables, right? You're interested, say, you have a network, right? you have a social network, and uh, every node may represent uh, um, something of interest, like some uh, some price or or or, or or weather or temperature or whatever, right? And uh, you construct a complicated neural network, a complicated uh, probability uh, distribution or that. And by using the structure of the graphing model, you can see, okay, which set of variables are independent to other set of variables conditioned on a third set of variables. So see that actually uh, the key of design, a good probabilistic graphing model is that you uh, introduce appropriate conditional independence assumption. Right? Um, and we'll introduce like, okay, in the network structure perspective, uh, how do you introduce condition independence? And how do, how do you detect condition independence? Right? We'll talk about so-called baseball algorithm. Right? And we'll, then we'll introduce uh, two types of uh, probabilistic graphing models. Uh, one is based on directed exactly graph, which is called base networks. That is called um, undirected graph, uh, graphing model. It's called Markov random views. Right? Then we'll introduce the so-called factor graphs. Right? So factor graphs uh, uh, is a special graphing model which not only represent the random variables, which are nodes, right? Also represent the terms in your drawn probability distribution. So through this factor graph, you can directly write down the drawn distribution. And based on the factor graph, we'll introduce the so-called message passing algorithm. Okay? So if your if your uh, if your graph structure um, has some nice property like it's a tree or it's a chain, then we can use the so-called sum product message passing and the maximum uh, message passing algorithm to efficiently compute the posterior distribution of the individual uh, nodes in your graphing model. Okay? And <clears throat> If there's some time, we're going to introduce, okay, what if your graph has some loops, right? That means uh, the massive passing won't guarantee the exact posterior distribution computation. But we can still use the same framework. We can just uh, keep pass messages uh, across the graph. Keep doing that, keep doing that until it converges. If it converges, uh, then uh, it corresponds to some uh, uh, optimum of some energy function design on this graph. Right? Okay, this is about uh, probabilistic graph models. And then <clears throat> we're gonna talk about uh, approximate, approximate inference technique. So by the way, the message passing is one <clears throat> approximate inference technique. When we talk about probabilistic graph models, although it's kind of like modeling too, but we also talk about uh, the algorithm itself, right? And then we'll talk, uh, uh, then in you know, approximate inference uh, uh, topic, we're gonna focus more on the computational perspective, right? How do you compute or approximate posterior distribution of the interest given an arbitrary probabilistic model, right? So we start with the Laplace approximation, which perhaps is the, a very classic one, very widely used one, but the, it's kind of outdated, but we still need to uh, learn the idea, right? <clears throat> And then we'll talk about the variational inference framework. From that, we'll, uh, uh, we'll learn what is expectation maximization algorithm, what is variational model evidence lower bound, what is mean field, what is local variational inference, what is convex conjugate, variational massive passing, all kinds of stuff. Right? <clears throat> we'll talk about expectation propagation, assume density filtering, those kind of things are generalization of the, uh, of the affirmation uh, message passing. And then we'll talk about the, the third framework we mentioned before it's called Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling, right? We'll give a, um, the uh, fundamental framework, which is called metropolis histing. So basically nearly all the modern Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling algorithms are a special type of metropolis histing, right? Then we'll talk about Gibbs sampling and also Hamiltonian Monte Carlo sampling. Uh, this one is, a, uh, is very, very useful in practice because it's much faster than like 
simple metropolis hastening is also more efficient than many, many gauge sampling approach right? and, and much less restrictive. Right? And then the remaining two chapters uh, and the two topics we're gonna uh, cover is the uh, two types of very widely used probabilistic models. One is called uh, Bayesian neural networks. Okay? So basically you can imagine like all right now, all kinds of neural networks, we can assign some probability, uh, probability distribution over the neurons. So get Bayesian neural networks. And we know that the standard way of training neural networks is called backpropagation, right? And correspondingly, we use the so-called base backpropagation, right? And which essentially is the variational model estimation framework. Um, and then we'll talk about the variational autoencoder, uh, which is a, a very standard um, dimension reduction and generation framework. Right? We'll talk about the reparameterization trick and concrete distribution. And you see that reparameterization trick is kind of like a very, it's kind of standard to train the modern neural networks. Right? And then we'll, we'll briefly introduce the general adversary neural networks. If we have time, we might also introduce the recent, very pop, uh, recent, uh, 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 which is mer which which is merging as very hot topics called Bayesian generation framework. So they are also probabilistic models. Like if you're a generating model, it's like if I want to generate image, how can I do that? I'm gonna first uh, add noise. I gotta put I gotta throw some dirks on those images. I throw more and more dirks on that, and until the whole image becomes white noise. Okay? And then. I'm gonna learn a model to remove those noise gradually from this noise until I recover that image. Okay. So those step-by-step -step procedure turns out to be much more effective than like general adversary networks, which train, the, which directly predict the whole image given the noise. Right? And that giant step might be too uh, difficult to fulfill. So this step-by-step -step approach uh, on the country is uh, much more stable. Right? <clears throat> But it depends. If we have time, we're gonna uh, spend one or two lectures introducing the diffusion generation framework right, for <clears throat> generative model. Right? And finally, we're gonna cover the Gaussian process models. Right? So um, uh, it's kind of a non-parameter modeling to estimate functions from data. It works very well when you have a limited amount of data. In that case, you already you won't be able to train a 200 layer neural network, deep neural network. Right? Um, we're gonna introduce Gaussian process regression and classification. You see that how we can place a prior distribution over functions, right? not only over numbers, over functions, right? And then we're gonna talk about sparse Gaussian process to handle, say, uh, low, some very large um, covariance matrices, uh, which is kind of computational bottleneck of Gaussian process. And if I'm time, we may also introduce a uh, uh, deep Gaussian process models. Any questions so far about those topics? Hopefully you won't feel boring about that. <laughs> I just, uh, if you feel exciting about that, I'll, I'll be very happy. <laughs> okay, about grading, right? So uh, the grading uh, consists of two parts. Um, one is homework, the other is cross project. And uh, we don't have any exam in this class. Right? So we don't have midterm exam, we don't have mid, uh, final exam. Um, what you need to do is finish about six homework assignments and your course project. That's the most important part. So we do believe that um, learning, gradually learning all those contests and perform well uh, throughout this semester is much better than you get a higher, a very good grade after one time final exam. Okay, so, uh, Let's uh, stop here today, and we're gonna uh, finish uh, our class uh, course policy review uh, early in the next lecture, and then we'll start looking at uh, basic knowledge, right?